on an uh, early career support event. You've heard me reference these three types of speaker or three types of employers, but I'm going to um, going to go through them again and put some insights and some context on from a CV, uh, or sorry, an interview um, perspective. Then I'll talk about interviewing methods, and then um, going to talk a little bit about the types of questioning you can get. And then I'll finish my little bit off on uh, preparing and how to prepare yourself and get in, the, in a mindset for going into an interview. So this very much builds on top of what we spoke about a few weeks ago on the CV and portfolio um, support event and building on the types of things we spoke about uh, back in March uh, with we had that event with Napier and back in May with the event with Robert Gordon uh, University. I'll then hand over to Hugo. Uh, he'll go through uh, his elements, getting ready for the interview, and then Hugo will pass over to Alex um, and she will cover topics during the interview. So, Right, uh, and again, just want to extend my, my thanks to Alex and Hugo and, and Matthew and all the rest of the other members in the CIAT Scotland East Aspiration team for inviting me along to, to this event and um, uh, supporting early career professionals uh, where I can. So you, you, most of you will know me by now uh, through the last uh, three or four early career support events. Um, previously, I was a lecturer at Edinburgh Napier um, and I used to work within the Scottish Energy Centre for, for 14 years, was a lecturer for four years and was uh, a researcher within architectural technology for 10 years before that. Uh, and during that time, I acquired teaching and learning qualifications. Um, and as a result um, of all the work that I had done with the AT students at Edinburgh Napier, um, has kind of allowed me to continue my role of supporting AT professionals within my new role of the director at Building Research Solutions. And at our company, we have a very strong culture of supporting early career construction professionals um, throughout every part of their career. And platforms like Aspirations and other um, early career networking support platforms like Talabd, et cetera, um, give us a good a platform as a dissemination vehicle to connect with uh, yourselves and to help you along your journey. Um, and as Alex and Matthew and Hugo have no doubt have already said, you know, if you ever want to talk to any of us, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to pick up the conversation about something more specific than what I'll be talking about today. So I'll be speaking about the interviews from an employer's perspective and the types of situations you might find yourself in during an interview. And it's all very much dependent on the type of employer. So um, I find that I'm using this slide quite a lot recently. And for ATs, we can, broadly speaking, break the AT employer type into three types and each will have very different interviewing methods. So we have the uh, small and medium architectural consultants and the small and medium system designers. Um, and you know, Alex, for example, Alex and Matthew here, would their organizations would fall under the small and medium architectural consultants. And uh, Hugo's organization, the one that uh, he works for at the moment during the summer, will fall under the small and medium system designers. So. In terms of giving insights on how they um, kind of view your uh, content that you're showing them, they want to see a, a good range of skills with a kind of wide scope on smaller projects. And we spoke about this in detail a few weeks ago about CVs and portfolios. But as we said last week, there needs to be a harmony and alignment between what your CV says about you, what your portfolio says about you. And then when you come into the room or the meet, the, the kind of virtual room, if it's a, a Teams or a Zoom type meeting, you want to make sure that whatever's gone before you in your CV and portfolio, then that's a true representation of who you are when you get into the room. And the language uh, and the kind of narrative you want to be using within this employer type is to show you've got a wide range of skills. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. But if you are still at university or college or you have graduated or about to graduate, depending on what month or what day we are in the, in the, in the month, 
you want to be focusing your experience or your narrative rather on your experience within the different types of modules that you have undertaken. We'll speak about that in more a little bit of detail. The other type of AT employer out there is the house builder, both at local level and at national level. And those are the ones we're all very familiar with. You drive past big building sites, the Kilowimpies, the Callas, the um, Persimmon Homes, etc. And in terms of insights, they're again going to be looking to see if you can be a uh, have a very effective understanding of the building standards and a very effective understanding of technical drawings and being able to replicate things very quickly, very efficiently. Uh, and again, they don't have as much of a need for a kind of wide range of different types of skill sets you may have picked up along your, your journey, either at university, college, or kind of other early work experience. But they're more focused on, can you produce highly efficient uh, drawings uh, very quickly? Then the last type of employer, uh, not the last type, but the other type of employer that's most common for ATs are what we call multidisciplinary AECs. Um, and those are likes of your Ricardos, your, your Rambles, your ACOMs, et cetera. And they very much in their kind of interview and from the types of content you're sending them and CVs and portfolios, they're very much looking to see if you're a team player and if you're able to um, think and coordinate and align what you're doing with lots of other disciplines that may be in-house within their organization to be an effective part of their team and align with their, their ethics. So now across these uh, these types of employers, we can kind of they, we can evenly distribute them across a scale of interviewing methods, and this scale is bound by how formal the interview environment is. Uh, and now, as with with all generalizations, there are some exceptions here, and you know this is not to say that you you won't find an SME out there who has a very formal method or you, you know you won't find a ACE company with a very informal method but again there's kind of high levels of certainty here that the SME type of interview environment is more informal and the, mo the multinational organizations that you're applying to will have a more formal structure and format within their interviewing process. So we can be uh, relatively certain because the methods are defined by the existence of a HR or human resources department. The larger organizations the larger the organization is, the more likely they are to have a dedicated HR department. And the larger the HR department, the more formal their processes have to be because they will be scrutinized internally and externally for the fair employment of employees and the fair handling of, of uh, human resources and personnel. So um, time for kind of some examples here. Well, I'm giving you some actionable intel on how you can apply this to kind of where you are right now on your journey to either going through interviews sometime soon or preparing yourself for interviews. The lack of a HR department means that the organization you're interviewing with will have much less structure, much less consistency, and therefore there'll be much, there'll be far fewer predefined questions. So this type of interview environment is very common, like I say, not exclusive, but very common to the small, medium business employer and the micro employer. And you can usually identify them by going on the website and having a look at the about us section or the people section or who we are section. And if the company has you know, less than about 15 people, it tends to mean it's going to fall, fall within the small, medium business category, which is on the informal part of the spectrum here. So this type of, um, of interview environment can be very informal and many that I'm aware of kind of pre-COVID apocalypse style uh, our time, a lot of these uh, in interview environments for small medium businesses tend to happen or occur in kind of cafes or kind of general meeting spots, um, which is about as informal as you're going to get. Now that now we've all kind of been equalized and normalized by Zoom and Teams and all those sorts of online meeting platforms, it, it 
it, the, the more informal the event is, the harder it is for you to know where you sit in the conversation. So the interview for SMEs on the informal side um, tends to include the managing director, which is the, the top guy, um, sometimes called the CEO. Uh, and that person will probably be the person you're also most likely to be working closely with during your time if you're off the job and you take the job. So within that environment, you're probably uh, more like you're most likely talking to and answering questions from the person who's right at the top of the organization and also that same person you will probably be line managed by or handled through day to day. So kind of having good first impressions there is really important. We'll come back to that. So then what I was saying next um, was that the larger organizations with stricter uh, HR recruitment policies have to process a large number of applicants every so often, every couple of months or every year. So they tend to have um, uh, an exam type situation that's often broken down into kind of three, uh, three parts. And the first part is something like an aptitude test. And I was saying there that the this is very common or very similar to a multiple choice type of question, uh, almost like a driving proficiency test if you've done one of those. And it's essentially there to make sure that you, you're you not an idiot and that it's, that it's worth their time interviewing you down the line. Then the second part of that process, if you get through the, if you get through the kind of aptitude test questions, then you go down to the the, the kind of one on one on one or face to face interview. And that tends to be with a HR personnel person and also someone high up in the organization. And this is to make sure that your ethics align with the ethics of the company. And these are the type of people that if you get the job, you'll never see these people again. You'll never see the director or one of the HR people again. And you probably not see the uh, high up member of that organization again, unless you're going on a Christmas night out and you kind of bump into them or you're being pulled in for disciplinary action. So that second interview tends to be with people you'll never meet again if you take the job. Then the, if you pass that part uh, and you're, you can show them that your morals and your ethics align with their organization, then there's a third and often final part of the process within larger organizations where there is a, a final face to face interview. And this tends to be with the people that will be in the same department as you will be if you get the job and you take it. Um, and this tends to be with someone who will be your line manager and someone who will be a director of something. So it won't be, it may not be the people you see day to day, but you'll definitely see them you know, week to week. Uh, and they're the people that you really want to put a, a lasting impression on. And the first two parts of that process is very much to show the organization that you're you're not a moron, you're not a flight risk, um, you're, you're kind of there for the right reasons. And then we get to interview three, or if you're at that interview stage where you know the people in the panel are going to be your line manager or are going to be in the same department as you're interviewing for, that's where you kind of want to razzle dazzle them with some of your really, uh, really um, deep knowledge on certain parts of the AT sector. Right, so um, how can you use all of that previous information to your advantage? So it's, it's often the case um, that an interview with a managing director or a CEO of a small medium business, those interview processes can often descend into casual, very, very informal chats and not even a proper conversation sometimes. And depending on how nervous they are, and, and I often say this sometimes, but the interview the interviewer can sometimes be more nervous than the interviewee because it's something that sometimes small companies don't always go through this process of interviewing people and it's not a common thing they do. Um, whereas if you're meeting with a HR representative from a big company, that's their day job. So they're used to speaking to new people. So depending on how nervous your SME interviewer is or how prepared they are, which tends to be very poorly, and the size of their ego, sometimes and unfortunately they can do about 80% of the talking in the interview. So 
when describing the SME interview process, um, I like to use the the kind of spider analogy. So where you know I'm I'm petrified of spiders, and whenever I was growing up, people would say to me, "You know that the spider's more afraid of you than you are of them." Well, the same is true for some managing directors and CEOs of small businesses. Sometimes they're that nervous to keep on talking and mumbling and never give you a chance to say anything or get a, a word in edgewise. But regardless of how much time you have to talk, you know, here are the kind of typical questions across the three employers. So like I say, the um, on the spectrum, your larger organization with dedicated HR departments will have a very dedicated set of questions and a very specific process to go through. And your SME employer will just be mumbling through stuff. But through all of the experiences that I've had on both sides of the table, I've kind of broken these down into typical questions that you get. So the if you're still at university or college or you're just about to leave or you've left not too long ago and you're kind of going through that almost first job type of interview process, the modules that you have studied are a very important part of the narrative you want to bring into the questions that you're answering. So here you want to highlight and spotlight a few key topics and aim for the ones with the best buzzwords to match what the industry is doing right now, like um, design for mass retrofit and net zero carbon and design for deconstruction, design for methods of construction, design for assembly, climate resilience example, or climate um, resilience um, uh, and examples of uh, climate projections for building environments and thermal comfort. All those are great examples and things you can kind of pull off key words by just spending a little bit of time on LinkedIn and following key people and seeing what the industry are talking about out there. And you're keeping it, keeping on top of whatever organization you're a member of. So if you're a, a student member or an associate member of CIAT, you'll get uh, our magazine every quarter and there'll be a, a monthly email that comes out. Just having a kind of glance at those before you go into an interview is good because you get those kind of what's really happening out there and how to bring key words in. So like we said last week, um, for this kind of uh, roles, and, uh, roles and responsibilities that you'll be talking about in your interview, using those key words and your experience, any experience you have of industry is a very important part of the process. So you want to focus heavily on the type and scope and impact of any projects that you have been involved in. So if you're currently in a situation where you've had a, a job, an, an AT specific job, or you've had something that looks like an AT specific job, it might have only been for a few days or a few weeks or a few months. Um, that can add, you augment that experience with what you've gone through with university and college, and that can then add a bit of extra value. And what your employer is looking for, regardless of where they sit on that kind of employer spectrum, depending on how informal or informal it is, they're looking to quickly see, they're looking to see how quickly they can put you into their role and get you to be almost self-sufficient as quickly as possible and to kind of start driving a, and being a, a significant influential part of each project. So you want to be focusing on how important that you were on the overall process whenever you were in other uh, construction based projects. And there, uh, you also want to focus on the things that you have been involved with within those uh, projects or those employment, um, those jobs that may not be totally directly involved with you specifically, but you were aware of it. So even though you may not have been in a, in a role in your previous job or your previous inter, uh, kind of uh, internship or your previous work experience, you may not have done your building warrant. Uh, drawings and building warm packages, but you're a part of the team that was putting uh, content to produce those packages and submit those things. Those are all information that the employer really needs to be made aware of to show that you have uh, you can play a significant role in putting together very important uh, technical drawing packages and such. So it's important also to show that you can embed quite nicely into um, the project team and you're aware of the 
uh, roles and responsibilities within the organization and you're also aware of the types of um, content that they're working on also which I know that uh, Hugo and Alex will talk about a little bit later on. So part of your portfolio as well, you want to be um, be ready for some employers to point at your portfolio and ask you, you know, why does that look that way? Or why is that thing over there? Or why, is, why isn't this thing considered? Uh, and if you follow our guidance in the last uh, aspirations event uh, a couple of weeks ago on portfolios and CVs, you'll have all the right answers for those why type of questions. So be be very aware that the other types of questioning may focus around what you're showing in your portfolio. So be aware of somebody pointing at anything in your portfolio and asking you how did that happen or why is that thing over there or have you considered this? So, and the best way, to, the best mind frame to get into for these types of questioning is prepare for it to be a type of kind of open-ended conversation where you're kind of talking about your thought process, you're talking about the things you considered, you're talking about all of the different elements that was involved and all the different variables that were involved with you making that drawing or that 3D image or that uh, construction detail or whatever that may be. So uh, when those sorts of questions come around and any kind of questions in general, you want to move away from being too defensive and you want to move away from giving a que an answer that's too short or too sharp. You kind of want to absorb the question a little bit and then start to work in those key words and key phrases you picked up online or from the uh, Architects Journal, um, a, uh, the Arch a Architectural Technology Journal rather, um, and take your time answering the questions as well. The next type of question that you can you most likely get are real world scenarios. So be prepared for the how would you react type of question. And Depending how much experience you have in industry type jobs, these types of questions can be really shitty questions. And depending on how much experience the interviewer has, um, the question might be very difficult for you to answer at all. But if you are an early career um, AT with little or no industry experience, you shouldn't get those type of questions, but often interviewers with no real experience can throw a question like, like that across the table saying, if a building warrant came back and had A, B and C wrong with it, how would you react? So responding um, to these types of questions often is a good indicator for the, for the interviewer to know how you handle kind of uh, pressures. And if you've gone through that in a previous job experience, then perfect, but if you haven't, one of the best ways to respond to that is by making reference to the company's policies and the company's chain of command and saying that you're following office protocols is usually the safest answer if you haven't got any experience with that. And um, those types of questions are usually designed to see how well you can troubleshoot and how well you can problem solve on your own, um, but also how much of a liability you might be. So if you do get those sorts of how would you react type of questions, you want to kind of consider those carefully before responding and always make reference to your line manager and the chain of command within the organization and getting proper sign off for things like that. So the, um, the final type of questioning you might be getting within an interview is something that's coming slightly more popular is the find the flaw in the in the technical drawing type of question. Now, these have been on the uh, a slight rise in the number of interviews that I've been present in recently um, as interviewers. And this may uh, have, this may be a construction drawing they put in front of you with very little or no annotation. And they'll ask you to either annotate the drawing or to identify the flaws and or to suggest what the what the remediation would be. Now, this is quite a popular method of interviewing question because it means that the interviewer can send you set a drawing in front of you, walk away for a coffee break. That gives them a chance to consider all the uh, answers you've given so far and then structure some more questions when they get back into the room. Now, if this does happen, 
remember that pretty much every construction detail can be solved by applying the principles of um, structural loading to foundations, fire stops and cavities, continuity of thermal envelope, continuity of the water and vapor control layers, uh, and the acoustic separation of elements between attached buildings. Um, and if you need more support than that, you can reach out to us and we can have a, a chat about that. So this, those, that, that advice I've just given is, is pretty good for lots of different situations, um, except for whenever you are, um, except for when you're in a situation where someone's talking at you for most of the time and you're trying to find a way to get a word, a word in edgewise, and those are very uncomfortable and hard to, hard to work with, but they do happen from time to time. And the best way to prepare for those is really have a set of key words and key phrases in your mindset that you can throw out when you do get a bit of a, a breathing space to say something. And you want to drop those really important things about what experience you have using certain modeling software or experiences you have designing certain building standards, uh, et cetera, and things, and things like that. So this is my last slide before I hand over. The, um, the most important message for when you're getting ready for an interview and uh, in any interview situation is to is to breathe and just steady yourself every so often. And some of these interview processes can be really intimidating where there's just you and there's four people across the way and the look as if they've been in the industry since the 60s or 70s and they know everything back to front and it can be a very intimidating environment. Steady breathing control may sound a bit trivial, but it is a fundamental part of surviving something like this, even like a exam conditions, because steady breathing control and the um, it can also help ensure that you're getting oxygen to your to your brain and ensuring that uh, your brain can help you during and uh, throughout the whole questioning stage, and you don't end up drawing a complete blank. So for an SME employer you really want to work on your small talk game. And this is something that uh, Alex uh, and uh, Hugo and Scott had picked up on in the last event. We spoke about CVs and portfolios. You really want to focus on um, your knowledge of local architecture, especially the buildings that the people who are interviewing you have worked on. Anec anecdotal stuff is very is very good and carries a lot of weight in these sorts of SME informal interview slash, slash conversations. The more informal the situation, the more the employer is looking to see if you have the type of attitude and type of mindset that they want on their team. So earlier on, I had said that the uh, more informal the process, you tend to have the people who's interviewing you tend to be the person who owns the company, the person who'll be your line manager, and also the person work work with day to day. So really what you're trying to do inside that interview process is get across your skills, get across your knowledge, but also just show that you are a likable character and able to work within their size of organization and able to be part of their, their team and help them hit targets. That's what you're looking to get across there. So the other kind of elements for preparing for the interview is to make sure that your CV uh, and your portfolio and your online presence within LinkedIn or whatever you're doing has good alignment and you're not contradicting yourself with what you're saying. Um, you also want to be able to recap your knowledge on the building standards. Again, as architectural technologists, there is a focus that there is an understanding or an expectation that you'll know your way around energy, acoustics and fire. So you want to kind of brush up on some of those numbers if you have a look at them for a while. You also want to um, recap on your uh, design decision processes. So again, this comes back to the why did you do this thing over here on your portfolio? You may have a few things in there in your portfolio that you put in a few years ago and it's a great piece of work, but you haven't thought about it since then. And you don't want to be caught out in an interview where they've asked you, why did you put the breather membrane over there? Or why did you put the windows on that side? And then you're kind of mumbling around a little bit trying to find an answer. You want to just kind of remind yourself how you designed those buildings if you get those types of questions. And finally, the last thing I want to say here is, and this is this particular piece of advice 
um, is a, is a bit of a, a a bit of a risky one, but can pay off quite well. High risk, high reward. Is you can create your portfolio in such a way, and you can create your CV in such a way where you can let them find the flaws. So you can create it in such a way where you have kind of open-ended elements that you know you haven't quite properly rounded off quite yet. Um, so that means when you get into an interview, you're almost certain they're going to point that out and ask you, why is this thing over here? Or how is that thing over there? Or something along those lines. And because you kind of have that set as a bit of a trap, you've already, when, it, when the question comes your direction, you've already got all those really important things that you want to say, the key words, et cetera. Uh, now, there is a fine line to be, be drawn here. It's a bit of a risky one. It's, a, it's advantageous in the fact that you know they're going to find the flaws you've left for them. So it means you can almost whole, completely prepare for the type of answer you want to give. But you also do want to have so many flaws that it, it, the CV and uh, portfolio doesn't get past the first stage and you don't get into the interview. But if in any way you can use that to your advantage, it is a very strong uh, way to play it because it means that you have many of the cards on your side of the table and you can then use all those key words and phrases you want to. Right, so I'm going to leave that there because um, I'm mumbling on for a long time now and I uh, want to hand over to Hugo. So Hugo, yes. do you want me to operate the slides for you? I can take an over as I do have some animation, maybe easier. Cool. I'll let you take. I'll let you take control then, Hugo. Yeah. Is everyone can see that? Yeah. Yep, I can see it, Hugo. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'm gonna talk about like how to get ready about uh, before the interview. So we're gonna talk about knowing yourself, learning about the company, and then the how to reduce stress and anxiety before. The interview. Oh, is that everyone can still? I can't see. Oh, sorry, something changed on my screen. Is everyone can still see the, yeah. the presentation? Yeah, great. Okay, because that changed on my slide. You're still on the contents page. Okay, Google. good, brilliant. That's exactly where I want to be. <laughs> so knowing yourself. So first, you need to identify your personal value and your professional value. So personal value is more uh, like what you really love to do. And this is really important because during the interview, what you will need to be is to be authentic. And you can't be authentic if you lie to yourself because you will lie to your employer and to the interviewer. So really need to, uh, to find what you really like. So for example, here I picked up three example, uh, running video game and hang out with friends. That some stuff that everyone kind of like, I guess. Maybe not running, but um, anyway. Uh, I recommend you to pick up up to five minimum and more if you want. Uh, and for prof professional value, I've got eco design, technology, and retrofit. So that those are the things that I really like. Then what I want to do is extracting the competences from what I personally value and what uh, from my professional value as well. So from, ex from example, running, uh, I can say that I embrace challenge. I embrace, I like to do planning as well because if I want to run for a race, I need to do planning for training, resilience as well. Video game, I can say I love technology, visual graphic, problem solving, hang out with friends. If you're really like one of your passions, you, you may be really good at public speaking connecting people, organization, organizing event, and you are also open-minded. And then what you want to do from there is create connection with what you value, with your professional value. So for example, eco-design, you got circular economy, you are, yeah, you are very interested into circular economy, regenerative design and passive house. So circular economy is something uh, quite hard to manage, I would say. So you embrace you embrace challenge. You like planning as well because it requires planning. Uh, regenerative design. You are open-minded. Passive house. Uh, you are problem solving because passive house is quite tricky to design. Uh, so you can connect everything. What your professional value are and your personal value. You can connect them together 
same VR, AR, your love for video game, the visual graphic and technology. You can connect all of that. And then you need to kind of prove it, like you need to, to say like, I like this, oh, sorry, I really like this because that. So for personal value, the only way to prove it is by storytelling. So you need to create story about like, for example, if the interviewer like can asking you about like, oh, you put running, what, what about like running is interesting for me? That's a really bad, ask like the question was really bad has but you, you got the idea hopefully so for example you say like well running requires a lot of planning yeah, i love to challenge myself i love challenge and i love to push my limits and see where my limits and so that can be kind of an answer that you can give to 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 your employer or video game you can say well i love visual graphic that's why i'm really interested in vr and ar and beam modeling and drone scan and so you have to linkedin and then to prove your interest in your professional value, you have to prove it through your por portfolio, uh, CV as well, personal knowledge, social network, post, blog, podcast. You have to create content about it, about what you professionally value. Then once you've done that, you can have a look at the company. So, uh, so if you want to, if you are going for an interview with the company and it's in two weeks, for example, uh, you, the first thing I would recommend to do is go on the, the website. Every So for SMEs, most, of, I think even like for bigger company, I'm, I'm not sure about bigger company because I've never really looked at big company to, to be employed by a big company. But for SMEs, there is always a home page, what the service are, project, our team and contact. So I'm going to through, go through the Coming & Co website, which uh, where Alex worked. Um, I've never had a look before um, last week when I've done the, the slide. So it was really like completely random. And we're going to have, have a look if I can connect my value with their value. So that's their own page. So they just so what is in not shaded as the interesting information. So for first one, you can see like architecture with people. So they design for people. We can we know they work through the UK. So it's just what UK based. OK, you got some information, quality, innovate. They like to innovate. So maybe you got some possibility to do some eco conception or new new stuff, new idea, VR, AR, uh, investigate new ideas and methodology. OK, so new ideas, sustainable. So as you are, as you like um, uh, eco design, that's that's good. It's not in bold, but it's still there is still the word sustainable. Expertise and technology. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting one because I really like VR and R and AR. So there is Beam. There is Beam. I really like Beam. Uh, Revit as well. Beam seminar, and they work across uh, UK and Europe, in Europe with their consultants. So that's great. Then you go there, like the page about them. So that's usually where you find like what their their philosophy are, their ethics, as John said. So here we got a bit like the company story, the philosophy, and then here you can read. We've got five year added our team, some younger members. So if you are, that was quite a good surprise. So that means like as a young AT, they are keen to, to accept me. Then you can see the service they do. Beam, I like it. Project planning, master planning, I love planning. 3D modeling, I love 3D modeling. That's a lot of things that you can talk about and ask questions. So those kind of information are really interesting if, to prepare questions to ask them. Well, at the end of the interview, usually they ask you like if you if you have some question. That's that's the way a good way to show your interest for the company. Uh, project as well, a good way to show your interest. So the idea is go through the project and you pick up the first one. You say like, oh, I like this one. That's the project you want to pick up. So for example, for me, that was the new house, Western Road Cults on the left side. And if you read the description at the bottom, you get outcome of this was stunning building, which is full of tech and is constructed to meet very high eco standard. So that's interesting because what does mean full of tech and what is very high eco standard. So that's a couple of questions I could ask and show my interest to the company and also discuss about a project that I, I 
genuinely enjoy what the what they done. Then the company. So that's the thing I, I, I would recommend to do for SMEs mostly because bigger company you can't do it. There is too many people, and as John said, you're going to be first interviewed by the uh, human resources, and then you then never never going to see them. So it's bit more tricky, but SMEs, you go have a look at the people and then you can follow them on LinkedIn. That's that's That seems like nothing, but the fact that they see your name on LinkedIn, the day of the interview, if there is fewer, like more, if there is like a, a several number of participants uh, for, the, for the job and for the interview, the fact that they know your name before the interview, the, the moment where they're going to interview you, it's going to be slightly easier because unconsciously they they already know you and they'll be more keen to to listen to you that's that's a bit tricky but but that's that's that that works that's the all the our how our brain works a little bit and then you can you got the contact us so usually it's quite interesting because you can email the them and then also you got Sometimes we map, you can see where it is, which is quite interesting for the day of the interview to know exactly where it is and ex especially more the train station. I had a bad experience on my last interview day. I was late because I, I didn't manage correctly the train. So closest train station if you don't have a car, that's a really good tip. Then you go on the social media. So, for example, here we got first slide. You got oh, they do on the left first uh, first post. They do have they did they do have an award for a building. I like the building as well. Uh, so that's that can be a good question to what why they win this award. CSIC second post. That's where I work for this summer. So I can I can ask them as well what 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 are they doing with the CSIC. And then I see that they do something. They've got a building in in Edinburgh, and actually, that's this building was on my way uh, on, when I was uh, when I was going to my previous job. So I saw the entire uh, construction of the building, and actually, I learned a lot from this building, from this construction building. So that's something I can talk about it during the interview as well. So that's basically a bit same like Instagram. We can see they do VR era, they do eco construction, they use timber, they love ice cream, they also love running on the right side. They do run as a team, so that's something I can bring because I do run. And again, timber construction. So then, yes, you have to follow the company on every social media that you can, that where they are present. That's as I said, like they know your name. If it's more than I would say two weeks before the interview, I would recommend you to comment and share the, their post, either from the company or from people working in the company. That will show them first your name and your interest. And on the day of the interview, it's going to be so much easier. And if you do that, for example, one year, like for example, let's say you are fourth year student last year, or even like third year, and you want to, you want to apply for an internship over the summer, go and find the people that you are interested in on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, follow them, comment on them, on, on their post, and you can share stuff with them as well. And this doing this regularly on a regular basis that can bring you from an interview from why do you want to, to work with us to here this is what you are you're gonna do for us this summer so social media uh, is so powerful it really it's really easy first to show your work and to follow people and show your interest to what they're doing and show what you value as well so go on social media then i gonna show you how to get ready for the interview and how to reduce stress and anxiety so that's something that i learned from tim ferris i don't know if you know guy uh, who is tim ferris is really interesting guy you can go have a look on on youtube and this is uh well he doesn't call it like that i don't remember how he calls it but for me it's like the omg i fucked up list that's where i write down before the interview everything that in that what happened in my head like oh like for example here well that was just like random uh idea but I've, some of them yeah find my interviewer sexy that that was like 
that I didn't plan it, but uh, it happened one time and I couldn't speak because my interview was really sexy and I was like really under pressure. Anyway, so that's the kind of thing you write down everything coming from coming to, through your mind before the interview. And what you do is so what can go wrong, then how to how to prevent uh, uh, what's going to happen and how do you are you planning to turn into to your advantage? So I haven't find something to turn to your advantage uh, uh, if you find your interviewer sexy, but if you do, please let me know. But that's the kind of thing that is really helpful first, like if that really happened during the day of the interview, you are ready to, to, to fix it. But also it more like most of it is just to, to make you conscious that what is running through your mind is mostly is mostly yeah, stupid. And yeah, so that's 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 a good exercise to do. And you can do it for mo not for only interview every time you want to start a new project or you are a bit scared about something. Just use this tool. It's quite it's quite fun to do and it's quite useful as well to reduce fear. Then this one is one of the most powerful ones. So John talked about talked about us about breathing. I think it's breathing like deep, slow breath is is crucial. Is one of the most the best tips. Uh, I, I I use it a lot. And this one is uh, oxytocin. So oxytocin, just to you know, is a neuropeptide. So it's kind of a neurotransmitter. It's just different. So to make it easy to understand, it neurotransmitter neuropeptide are the the chemical that create emotion in our body. For example, one a neurotransmitter that everyone knows is adrenaline. So adrenaline creates stress and and increase our health rate. And oxytocin is kind of the opposite. It reduces stress. It makes you feel love. Uh, that's the kind of feeling that you have when you are, like if you imagine that you are under a blanket on a really soft sofa and it's a rainy day, it's really cold outside and you are drinking a hot cup of tea. That's the kind of feeling that you've got. Uh, that's if you imagine that and you've got like this feeling of relaxation, that's that is oxytocin. So one of the best trick I've got, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, my screen for a second because I want to show you something. How do I share stop there? Can you see me? So good, thank you, Alex. So one thing I do before every now every interview or even during the day when I'm quite stressed, I take up my phone. I go on photo. I tap Millie, which is the name of my little sister, person I really like. And I look at picture of my sister and I. And that. Uh, just doing that make me less stress, more authentic, happier, and more relaxed. She's beautiful, by the way. I really miss her. So if you've got people or even animals, I know that Alex has got a beautiful dog. So if you got a picture of them, that's a really good advice I can give you. That's I learned that like a few months ago and this is the most powerful thing. So if you got like, if you got baby, a baby, if you got, I don't know, your, your mom, your grandma, take, get some picture of them on your phone and right before the interview, it takes 30 seconds to, to, to take action on your body and it really, really, really stress. It's incredible. Anyway, that's, that's, that's for me. I'm going to, share again the slides for Alex now because that was my last slide if you remember the exchange event here we are so that's uh, Alex now Alex I'll let you speak. thank you um yeah I definitely agree with the whole oxytocin thing before any presentation I just cuddle my dog and it sets me right for the mood it makes me very happy it's yeah. brilliant um, so yeah, so I'm going to discuss um, basically tips for how to kind of be successful during the interview because obviously you can plan all you like but if you're nervous going in or something was wrong just before you go in 
you want to have some coping mechanisms in place to kind of make sure you stay on track during the interview and also a bit of do's and don'ts for when you're discussing your work and things like that as well. Um, so I'm just going to run through, obviously, I'm discussing how to show off your skills, then how to just discuss your work and then questions for the interviewer as well, because that's quite important as well, showing an interest in the interviewer and in the company as well is a big one. Uh, so we can go into the next slide and I'll get started. OK, so although you obviously want a job, you're really keen to start working in the industry, make sure the companies that you're actually applying for are companies you'd enjoy working for. It's kind of hard to tell from a social media presence, but you'd get the idea during an interview as well, whether you see yourself fitting in. It's a two way street. They try to see if you'd fit in with the company, but you need to make sure the company's right for you. Um, if your, your core values should naturally align with that company as well. If they are interested in tech and you're interested in tech, that's great, but you shouldn't be forcing yourself to fit a box for a company because that will fall through for you and you wouldn't be happy working there long term. Uh, oh, someone's waiting in the lobby, I'll just let them in. Okay, um, and also don't be afraid to focus on your biggest and best achievements, but keep it in moderation as well. You want to be confident in yourself, obviously, you want to show your best assets, but you do not want to come across as arrogant, because at the end of the day, um, the majority of you are graduates, and I speak for this as well, I graduated last year, there's no way for us to know everything, so don't act like you do. You want to be there showing a willingness to learn rather than being a bit of a know-it-all. It won't come across too well, especially for SMEs, where they're kind of like almost a family unit. They've worked together quite closely for years. You want to work well with those people. You don't want to come across as thinking you're better than those people. Um, and also mention any extracurriculars that show that you're good in a team working environment, especially if it's an SME interview, because obviously a lot of it will be team based in those kind of environments as we are ATs. It's a collaborative environment we'll be working in. And um, even if it isn't AT specific, whether that could be, I don't know, being part of a volleyball team, it's still showing you work well as a team. That's what I did in uni. Um, that kind of thing definitely shows your best assets if you can show that you can work in a quick environment that's working with people you may not know too well, things like that is very handy to have. And yeah, like I said, you have no way of knowing anything. Don't act like you do either. Um, but provide evidence to show what you've learned so far, that being said, um, what you're interested in learning more about and focus on past situations where you've learned from your peers, colleagues, management, things like that. So although you're making it clear, you by no means have all the tools in your toolbox, you have shown you've added to that as you went through your life so far. Um, and the majority of companies, um, especially SMEs, would much rather hire someone with less practical skills who they see getting on well with their colleagues rather than people with a high practical skill level that would have to work alone uh, purely because they could teach you practical skills. That's things that you can pick up as you go. Learning how to be a nice person isn't really something that you can learn on the job. It's something that you kind of inherently have to be respectful and so on. And it's a lot harder to teach that to someone. Um, and we can help hop on to the next slide. I've kind of run through that. But it's fine. Um, so during the interview, obviously, um, when you're discussing your work, if you have work in your portfolio, which is similar to the company's most recent projects, focus more on that and mention it when the opportunity arises. You don't want to try and shoehorn in information, but if they're discussing a recent project that's maybe a domestic house, such as one that um, Hugo showed earlier from Coming and Co and one of your projects at uni or one of the ones you did on experience was a one-off new build house. You can try and link the two together and show, oh, I have experience doing that sort of thing. I really enjoy that side of things. And it gives the employer an idea of where you'd thrive and where you'd like to head in that department as well. Um, ensure that you're realistic though when you're discussing the amount of you've contributed to group projects. Uh, you don't want to kind of oversell yourself and say, oh, yes, I managed this and I did that. If that wasn't actually the case, because you're setting yourself up for too high expectations that you'll struggle to reach. But also it's giving the company kind of a false sense of security. They're wanting to make sure that their new employee is someone that they can count on and rely on when they're giving the workload. And if you try and take too much on too fast with little experience, that could kind of hurt in your favour. That couldn't really lie in your favour too, favor too well. Jeepers. Um, but also don't sell yourself short. It's always very much everything's in moderation. There's two sides to each of these points. 
Uh, you want to take pride in your work today and remember that you will have time at the end to provide any extra information that you haven't had the opportunity to mention in your answers. So take your time, not like I'm doing now, uh, take your time in the interview discussing your work and uh, if something doesn't come up naturally you can just add it in at the end. There's no point forcing the conversation down one route if the employer is genuinely interested in what your current topic is as well. Okay. Um, we can go on to questions for the interviewer. So at the end of the interview, a lot of the time, especially in the interviews I've been part of, you get an opportunity to ask the interviewer questions about the company or what you'd expect to work as and things like that. And it's important to choose maybe unique questions that'll make you a bit more memorable rather than just asking what's your regular pay and things like that, what's your holidays that come as like kind of a standard discussion once you're offered the job. Uh, ask things that you're genuinely interested in finding out. So how would your success or performance be measured in the workplace? What would your responsibilities look like for the first three months? Because that's something that you would really like to know before you start your first day is what will be expected of me in this role? And also as ATs, uh, obviously you'd hopefully want to progress to be um, a chartered architectural technologist. So you'd want to probably work for a company that kind of values chartered ATs and promotes that in their company. So asking them questions about that early on, not just throwing it out like, oh, will you help me be chartered? But asking them if they have an inkling um, into supporting that um, is definitely important if you're looking for that for your career progression. And it also shows to the company that you're interested in growing as a person rather than just applying for the role that's available. You want to progress in that company as well, which is really good. Because um, if you stick to the generic questions, you're less likely to leave a good, memorable impression. And then at the end of the day, if they've interviewed maybe 10, 15 people, they'll want to remember the people that have taken an interest in their company as well. OK. OK, so my final points, I have rushed through this a bit, so don't do what I'm doing just now in an interview, take your time. Um, but yeah, so um, any goals discussed or any way that you'd be assessed should be genuinely manageable for you in order to avoid burnout. You can be ambitious, you can say, I want to strive and do these goals, but do not fill your plate with them too early on before you've set your foot in the door and figured out how the company runs itself. You don't want to overwork yourself too early on. Um, and also in virtual interviews, take advantage of the limitations. You cannot see anything that's around this part of my screen. The same way in a virtual interview, your interviewer can't either. There's nothing stopping you putting up post-it notes of the key points you want to cover. I've got little notes all over my screen just now. Um, so it, there's nothing stopping you doing that, but don't overdo it. You don't want them stuck on your ceiling and looking like this, looking for points. Keep it to clear, concise things that you feel you need to cover during an interview and have those as little bullet points around the side just to keep you on track and make sure that you're, do you're covering everything you want to say. Um, and also, you want to be authentic. You can try and align with the company's core values, but if it doesn't naturally align with you, it is a bit more difficult. So make sure that it is genuinely a company that you can see yourself getting on really well with. And uh, don't be arrogant with it. Uh, one of the best things I've said in an interview was uh, what I lack in industry experience, I make up for with a good work ethic. And I think that's something that every graduate should try and show in their interviews is that although we've had maybe six months of experience and things like that that built into our course or so, so thereabouts, um, we'll still make up for that with a good work ethic. We're willing to learn, we're willing to advance in our careers. And if you show that to a company, especially SMEs, where that's kind of where they're trying to nurture young people and get them through and through their, uh, further down their careers, and uh, that's something that's very important to them, it's very important to you, and it's something that you can also uh, talk about as well. 